Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us today. I'm Felicia Henderson, and I'm thrilled to engage in this important conversation about developing diversity, equity, and inclusion as organizational leaders and as individuals. We have quite a distinguished panel today, but before I introduce our panelists, I first want to thank the Hoffman Global Institute for Business and Society for creating space for this important conversation during SDG Week. Now to our panel of INSEAD All-Stars, who I am going to introduce alphabetically. Marlon Bowen is an INSEAD MBA graduate and was the Gra uh, Greendale Scholar and graduation speaker for the 15J promotion. He currently works at First Rand Limited, the largest financial services provider in Africa, where he designs and delivers banking solutions to the South African middle class and working poor. Welcome, Marlon. Zoe Kinias is an Associate Professor of Organizational Behavior at INSEAD. She is also the OB Area Chair and the Academic Director of INSEAD's Gender Initiative. In addition, Zoe is a member of the core team currently examining how to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion at INSEAD. Welcome, Zoe. We also have Susan Lloyd Horwitz, uh, excuse me, Susan Lloyd Hurwitz, um, who is an MBA graduate and a member of the NCAD board. Susan is the CEO and managing director and a member of the board of Mirvac, a world-class Australian stock exchange listed uh, property group. Susan is the immediate past president of the uh, Property Council of Australia the chair of the Green Building Council of Australia, and a member of the New South Wales Public Service Commission Advisory Board. And finally, Lucy Quist, who is also an MBA graduate and a member of the NCAD board. Lucy is a managing director at Morgan Stanley and is the chief diversity and inclusion officer for tech operations and firm resilience and head of change leadership and technology transformation. Lucy is the author of the book, The Bold New Normal, and is known for being the first Ghanaian woman to head a multinational telecommunications company as the former CEO of Airtel. So welcome to all of our panelists. Let's jump right in. Um, our viewers perhaps know that the sustainable, sustainable development goals um, Sorry, I'm not seeing our panelists. Uh, um, but uh, our viewers perhaps know uh, that the sustainable development goals include uh, goal five, gender equality, focused on empowering women and girls and ensuring their equal rights, and goal 10, reducing inequalities focused on supporting the uh, marginalized and disadvantaged. Our panelists are here to help us understand why and how businesses can incorporate these two goals, which speak specifically to diversity, equity, and inclusion into business models and practices. So Susan, I'd like to start with the why. Under your leadership, Mirvac has set some ambitious environmental sustainability goals for 2030. Net, carbon, uh, net positive carbon, net positive water, zero waste, and this is for a construction company. So what does inclusion have to do with your ability to deliver on this strategy? I think there are really two answers to that. And yes, it is a very ambitious strategy, which we call this changes everything. And it's not just around water waste and energy, of which water is the most challenging of those, but also around social. And so I would say there are two interconnections between diversity and sustainability. And one is that we know all business outcomes are better when you have a diverse and inclusive organization. So that is true also for sustainability outcomes. So in getting our organization to achieve those targets, having a diverse and inclusive, and those two things are really important to me because you can have the, all the diversity you want, but if it's not psychologically safe and you're not inclusive, it's all for naught. So we know that all business outcomes are better, and that's proven by academics, including INSEAD academics. All outcomes are better with diversity and inclusion. Therefore, sustainable 
outcomes will also be better. The second one really is more around the inclusion of the most marginalized voices. So we have a goal, for example, under our strategy to have uh, a proportion of our spend be with social enterprises. And that is really trying to engage the voices that never get heard, the people that never get the chance, uh, the, the people that naturally aren't in our orbit um, to try and be inclusive of that community as well. Uh, finally, I, I was really struck, actually, we, had, we were doing some ethics training and at Mervac, we do, we do hold ourselves out to be a force for good. We are not perfect, but we hold ourselves out to be a force for good. And doing this ethics training, I suddenly thought, we're a force for good for people just like us. Where are the other people whose voices are not heard? And so that's where I think the intersection of inclusion, diversity, and sustainability comes. Thank you, Susan. Um, Lucy, let's continue with the why. So again, asking this question, what does inclusion have to do with corporate sustainability? This summer, your firm added a fifth core value committing to diversity and inclusion, um, making this value explicit along with your four other uh, traditional values. Now, how does this explicit commitment help Morgan Stanley better serve your clients? Um, thanks, Felicia, and good morning, good afternoon, and evening to everyone. Um, so we felt the need to add an additional value to explicitly demonstrate our commitment to diversity and inclusion, because for, for um, the longest time, diversity and inclusion had been embedded in one of our other values, which is around doing the right thing, because doing the right thing by all people includes making sure that you're diverse and includes, inclusive. Sorry. Um, but we felt that it was really important to call it out very directly so that, you know, the, going back to Susan's example around training, especially when we do culture training, it's really important that it's explicit in what we do. Now, when you think about it, some of the issues that have come to light this year um, have really shifted the, co the, the conversation around the purpose of the corporation. So we, we used to talk specifically around stakeholder value. And we used to think a lot around profit um, globally, whereas now with corporate sustainability, the conversation has shifted very directly into the, uh, an organization's role in the wider, not just society in which they live, but really the globe and an organization like ours, we serve across the globe. So you have to think more you know, ethically, you know, what's the social impact, the environmental impact, cultural and economic. Um, excuse me. So while we have our sustainability institute, it was important that in in terms of everything else that we do in the organization, um, diversity and inclusion is very directly um, called out. So what does it mean? It means that we want greater representation in the workplace. Uh, absolutely. But it also means driving and creating an inclusive workplace where people can be their own authentic self. If we have better representation, and I, I mean, one of the things our CEO has said very publicly, James Goldman, was around the fact that we want our um, employees to reflect the societies in which we live and operate, which is different in different locations, but we have to be representative in the location. So we want to create opportunity for everyone to thrive. If we create opportunity, not just for people to thrive, we will produce better solutions. Right. But more importantly, we are in a position where we, you know, as a financial institution, we influence so much of what goes on because you know, money does a lot of things in our world and financial decision making that we can influence our, 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 not just our, our employees, but also the clients that we serve and work with in terms of the choices they make in the wider community and in the world at large. So it's really important for us to play a significant role in corporate sustainability, first by practicing what we preach, committing to diversity and inclusion, but then influencing um, outcomes and truly being that force that makes a difference, continues to make a positive difference in advancing our society. And I'll just add one, one last point there. I think a lot of what's going on in the world today is yes, partly because of people like us on this call, but I think more importantly, it's because we now have a swell of a generation that is saying that the world has to change, that is saying that social justice matters and the right thing matters. And whether it's happening in Jakarta or it's happening in Montreal or it's happening in uh, Pretoria, it matters to them. And so I, I think collectively we have to appreciate that, that thankfully we are in a world now where we have a generation 
for whom this really matters. So to sustain a corporation, even as a business, we have to care for, if, for nothing else. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Zoe, I, I'd like to turn with you. So Susan and Lucy make a very convincing case for DEI as a key asset, an integral part of a sustainable business model. And as Susan alluded to, a growing body of research shows us that diverse teams from the operational level right up to the board level are smarter, come to better decisions and yield better outcomes. But despite these benefits, we know <laughs> that many companies lag in creating diverse workforces and inclusive workplaces. So what is so hard? What are some of the obstacles that businesses encounter to achieving greater uh, DEI? Thank you for asking, Felicia. And I've really enjoyed listening to Lucy and Susan already talking about the benefits. And what is quite interesting in my mind is that the absence of the diversity and inclusion that they're talking about despite the fact that we know it can benefit us, it, the absence of it can be self-reinforcing. So we talk about this as a systemic web of challenges here at INSEAD. And the idea is that these challenges within our societies more broadly and within our organizations and our industries more specifically are constantly recreating themselves unless we are actively engaging in shifting them. They won't change if we don't work towards that. So that's one of the, the fundamental challenges with respect to this work. So we can think about there are some um, industries, some um, organizations that were explicitly designed to exploit. We have to acknowledge that. But well beyond those, we can think of the American sugar crop industry, for example. I mean, there's, there's the very ugly stories. But even beyond those, there are lots of contexts where nobody is at fault for this, but they were designed for usually European white men by European white men. And so when the systems and the structures, the practices, the um, evaluation criteria, all of these um, systems and processes were designed with a particular model in mind, then that's part of how that um, the status quo gets reinforced. Now, that's the fundamental sort of the system in itself, but more practically, concretely, what we see is that individuals, even those of us who want to be changing and want to be benefiting our organizations and our societies can be blind to those ways that our norms, our cultures, and our practices are biased first. And second, how they um, really can, even sometimes trying to help, can end up backfiring because of the, the way these, these challenges are system, systematic and systemic. So this is the sort of the, the, the nice part, like we just don't realize what's going on. Now, the other thing that we see a lot is that many organizations are resistant to change also because there are some folks who would be happy to continue benefiting from the biases that benefit them. So there's a little bit of that. And then the other piece that I know we'll talk about a little bit more today is that this work is not easy. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. It's hard work, even for those who really want to be doing it. And I think everyone on this call appreciates this. So. We need to um, fight the fatigue. We need to make sure that we um, highlight and, and reinforce the, the bolstering of our own and each other's resiliency and to keep in mind how important it is, which Susan and Lucy already shared with us to keep our eye on the goal. So thanks for asking, Felicia. Thank you, Zoe. Um, Marlon, I would like to bring in a crucial pers perspective that's not always included. So companies often identify the intended beneficiaries of DEI initiatives, but fail to listen to the specific concerns of these populations. There was a surge in demand this summer for DEI practitioners to facilitate focus groups of black employees in the US. And this was an urgent step um, for many companies in beginning to listen to these marginalized voices. I um, am hoping that you can share with us your perspective on some of the challenges that underrepresented minorities face when entering uh, some of these work cultures that, uh, that Zoe has described. Right, thank you very much, Felicia. 
Um, it's a real privilege to be here with, with some incredible, incredible participants. So thank you. I'll try and talk about that at a sort of global, generic, millennial level. Because uh, I think ultimately, if I distill it into one sentence, it's it's this constant shifting of the sand, this unaware, like this, this, this struggle to know if I can just be in the space. And sometimes it's a physical constraint. It's the woman who is uh, pumping breast milk in the toilet because there's no room for her. It's the Muslim man praying on the balcony because there's no space. It's the five Indian guys in the Danish company who are scared to have a coffee together because pretty soon rumors of an Indian mafia will circulate. So sometimes it's just a, a physical space problem. But, but more than that, it's this mental drain because at the heart of that mental drain, first and foremost, you're not an individual which I don't know is something that a lot of white people often understand. But if Lucy fails, Lucy fails as a Ghanaian woman, she fails as an African woman, she fails for the ECOWAS economic territory, she fails for Africa. Um, and, and, and her actions then basically convince that company that this diversity action, I think to Zoe's point, reinforces itself. Maybe we shouldn't be trying, we, maybe we shouldn't be trusting Ghanaians, maybe we shouldn't be trusting black women. And so you know that the sand is never going to be firm underneath your ground because when you need to be an individual or be considered as an individual, you won't be. And, put, and sometimes when you need to be part of the group, it won't be there as an access to you too. For me, I kind of distill that as this idea of how corporations hold people. And, and I mean hold you in, that, in, the, in the classic psychological sense, right? Whether it's a mentor who, um, a mentor who compliments you or advises you on something, that friend who pulls you for a coffee and says, the last four people who did this, they failed because of X, Y, and Z, so don't. Or, hey, that guy, he prefers a one-on-one -on -one to the group sessions. You gotta go and do that a bit differently. The struggle for us is we know that the pathway to being held is both longer and more arduous. And so, and, and, and I mean, I could talk more specifically because there are things that happen more specifically within it, but in a nutshell, that's it. It's, it's this awareness that there are parts of me that I have to keep to myself because people will see them as me sort of, I guess the best example I have practically is over the last 10 or 15 years, the Afrikaans, the second language I speak in my home has suddenly been validated because as colored people, we were told that it wasn't pure Afrikaans. And so, the older I get, the more I come back to that language. It's a source of my identity. But to talk that way in a corporate context would essentially be to, to mark myself as someone who isn't intellectually capable. And it's these kinds of examples, and it's a small one, but, but it's, it's this, this awareness that how I am, what I think, I have to curtail myself. I have to be aware that if I say something, I'm going to trigger someone who doesn't necessarily see me as an individual and see my views as just having a right to coexist with theirs. I hope I hope I've given uh, an answer there. You you have a very moving and, <laughs> and eloquent answer, and I'm hoping that uh, collectively we can begin to uh, discuss solutions uh, to begin to create uh, this holding space to begin to firm up the ground um, beneath uh, many of of our um, uh, you know uh, colleagues and friends. Um, I do want to encourage the audience to uh, submit questions. You can certainly use uh, the, the Q&A box for that. Um, we now uh, hopefully have a clearer picture of the promise and the challenges of developing DEI in business. And what I'd like to turn to now is some solutions. How do we uh, go about um, farming up this ground? How do we go about creating the psychological safety for um, all employees. So Lucy, I'd like to start with you um, with what might be a provocative question. So we now see a hiring frenzy for chief diversity officers, and it was accelerated by the global movement for racial justice this summer. Many of the CDOs hired are black and more specifically black women. Now I am a big believer in black girl magic, but can one person or one social identity group fix the problems that Zoe and Marlon have mentioned? How should we allocate responsibility within companies to bring about lasting change? Um, thanks, Felicia. And um, in response, I'm going to start off from you know, something that Marlon talked about. The bottom line is that we still find ourselves in a situation where Either you're, you're the only one or one of very few in the room, 
But I think that the other piece that no one, you know, the part that when you're the only one, people can see you're the only one in the room. I don't think many people appreciate the burden of feeling that your success and your failure is representative of an entire group of people. I think that is the biggest unspoken um, burden of, of all, because it doesn't matter how, how good you are. And look, we're all human, so we will all sometimes make mistakes or sometimes won't always work out. And I can, I can deal with that as an individual. But the point is that it, two things happen when things go wrong. First of all, for some people, that um, completely wipes out everything else that you've achieved because, oh, you've proven them right that, yeah, you, 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 someone like you couldn't do the job. But also, um, you, your representation of an entire group is hinging on your, your performance. So that in and of itself presents the first challenge to this whole idea of um, whether the CDIO can, can, can solve it all. The answer is no, right? The, the, you know, one person can't solve all of this because to Zoe's earlier point, these are complex conversations and culture shifts and more importantly, mindset shifts that need to take place, which demonstrates that one person can't fix it all. But I do believe that there is great value in having somebody who identifies as a minority in the role. Because one of the things we need to shift is that the conversation has to come from the perspective of the people who experience what the challenges are. And I'm not, I, I never pretend that I have every single minority experience, but because I, I have some of the experience, I'm able to reach out and connect with people and, and you know, listen and see things from their perspective and perhaps create room for them to be, be comfortable to share what matters to them. Um, and I, I can give you an example, like you know, sometimes people have felt very uncomfortable talking about, for instance, religion. Right? But once I engage them uh, and they, they know that I, I understand, they're more open to say, you know, I wish we do X about religion or someone engaged me on something as, as simple, which sounds simple as, you know, the other day, another colleague came to work and she was wearing a sari and I felt so proud and I felt so included that someone as senior as her could feel comfortable wearing a sari, which we do wear in my country to work here uh, and be accepted. So no one person can't do all the work. I think it's really important to recognize that you have to form a coalition and an army of people. I think I'm very fortunate because I, I work in an organization where it's actually been called out as a value. So that makes a big difference because that's like a Trump card you can pull, no, I shouldn't say Trump, but a card you can pull out. Um, but at the same time, um, you still it doesn't change the fact that there's work to be done. And that work that has to be done means that you have to create a coalition, you need to connect with people, you have to ask for resources. Don't go out there and assume that you know, you're know you Wonder Woman or Superman and you're gonna just uh, wave a wand and get it all done because you showed up. You have to also focus on goals and accountability. So don't make it just a soft conversation. Uh, most institutions are driven by some form of metrics and people believe in metrics because that's how you try to create a level playing field. Well, this is also something tangible. So I'm not just talking about goals around getting um, um, representation, but goals around what it actually means for people in the organization to make progress, to advance their careers, to be included, for their thoughts to be present, to for a decision-making panel to always be diverse, so on and so forth. You need really, really um, tangible goals and metrics to work with. I think the, the hard thing as an individual is to always understand when you're feeling emotional about a conversation, and step outside of that emotion because sometimes it can cloud your judge, judgment. Um, and that makes it really important that you have people that you can rely on and who are sounding boards for you so that you can, you know, they can hear your emotion. The whole world or the whole panel doesn't have to hear your emotion, right? And be a communicator. If it's not the thing that you do really strongly, start to communicate more and more with people, not just as they learn, but also as you, you provide solutions. And I think. The last thing I'd add, um, and this is more personal, um, find ways, I would suggest that the, the individual who's leading or the individuals leading the charge in any way, shape or form, find ways to disconnect. Um, it, it is probably, you know, I've done many jobs in, in my life, but I think this one, because it, it can be quite personal, can also be extremely taxing. And each day, as much as is possible, try to find a few minutes to switch off from your world as you exist in it and just be 
for some time um, so that you can recharge for the next day. So slightly long-winded answer, but no, one person cannot fix it all. We are uh, uh, going to uh, be sharing some of our, our personal challenges and, and strategies um, more specifically. But before we get there, I do want to uh, turn to Susan and hear about uh, some solutions. Um, we know has, uh, okay. <laughs> we know that uh, as um, Lucy has suggested, this cannot be the work of one person. But we also know that this cannot succeed without leadership from the top. And Zoe and I had the wonderful opportunity to develop a teaching case about a DEI initiative that you led. Um, at the time, I recall you faced skepticism as a woman in a blokey industry. Um, you had st uh, stakeholders, shareholders who were telling you to stop talking about people and sustainability. I believe you said people thought you were mad. And even some of your own executives um, were reluctant, but the initiative was a rousing success. And Zoe and I had the, the chance to admire uh, your leadership, and we would love if you could share with our audience the leadership qualities and behaviors that allowed you to overcome uh, these challenges. Um, what advice might you offer to other leaders? Well, the, the very, very kind words. And and a lot of it, if, if I tell a story in retrospect, I'm very conscious that it can sound like we had this grand plan and we did all these things and hey presto, we've taken employee engagement from 37% to 90, we've taken diversity up, uh, we've got an award-winning innovation program, but it's not like that in the real living of it. There's lots of mistakes and back steps and things that don't work and there is no playbook. And to bring things into the current moment, there is certainly no playbook now. There is, There are no rules or past experiences that guide us in this moment that we are in both politically, socially, environmentally, and health-wise. So, so really it was, I think, stemmed from, from a, a real belief that this is the thing we had to do. And we started with the most difficult thing that we can think of, which was how to get diversity, inclusion, flexibility as the way into that on our construction sites. Because everybody says, you can't do construction flexibly. And so we, we tried to attack it from the hardest bit first to, to prove that, well, if you can do that, well, then there's no excuse for anybody else because these hardest people have done it, uh, was one way. And, we, and really, I'm also very conscious about if you hold yourself out for a force for good, which INSEAD does and MERVAC does also, there's enormous responsibility with that because if you aren't a force for good, it's almost worse than having never held yourself out to that. The corporate spin is just dreadful and people can smell that hypocrisy a mile away. If you're talking about diversity or sustainability or something in corporate spin terms, immediately discounted and you set the cause back. So we were quite conscious to try and focus on not talking, but doing. And only after years and years of doing some talking to come after it, to show this is our journey that we've been on. Let me offer this to you and see if this is helpful for your journey. But it did stem from my very fundamental belief that it was a better way to be. And we just followed one step and one decision after another to take us where, where we are. But uh, you, you really, you don't need to have a 10 year plan for how you're gonna do this. You just need to make the next decision and then the next decision and then the next decision. Oh, that was wrong, backtrack, the next decision. And that's uh, from a leadership point of view, how, uh, you know, to ignore the people that say, stop talking. So the, the, the end point of that story, which is a great story, this guy that told me in an investor meeting, he had a tip for me, I said, What's that? He said, just, can you please stop talking about people and sustainability? And I said, thank you very much. No, I can't. A few years later, we re, uh, we did our version two of our This Changes Everything sustainability strategy. And we did a launch uh, with investors in a day when you could have investors in your boardroom, apart from me being in my spare bedroom here. And this, this guy that said that was at that lunch. And I told the story without mentioning who it was, of course. And afterwards he came up to me and he said, 
was that me? And I said, yeah, it was. He said, well, I'm here to tell you I'm a convert. And so ignoring the advice of our security holders and saying, no, this is the course. This is what we believe in. If you don't believe in it, there are lots of great companies to invest in. Please feel free, but we are going to do this. If you want to come with us, come with us. If you don't, feel free to invest elsewhere, I think. So that so a really strong grounded, this is right. This is what we need to do. We don't quite know how, but we know fundamentally it's right. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Um, so Marlon, I, I want to turn to you again for uh, the youth perspective. Um, now, in, in companies where leaders are not as courageous, as visionary, as, as committed, as, uh, as we've heard from uh, Susan and Lucy, um, or even where they are, it may be necessary for employees lower, lower in the hierarchy to recognize their own agency, um, to be able to shape not only their own experience, but also the broader cultures. So what are some of the strategies that you've used or that you wish you had known that you recommend for recent grads to uh, begin to navigate uh, DEI challenges and shape culture from the bottom or from the middle? Sure, um, thanks. I'll, I'll take a stab and I guess some of it is as much uh, my thoughts based on my own failures, I think, as, as anything else. I think the very first point I'd say, and it's a really difficult one if you do come from a minority background because it it's, you're not always lucky enough to have parents in a community that instills it in you, but it's a strong sense of self-worth because you are not going to get the same level of compliments. You're not going to get the same level of support up front. So this work on yourself, knowing your, 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 your values, knowing when you do quality work and, and being proud of your work and having your, your bar, with you, where it goes into boundaries too. But I think the first very very clear thing for me is being very clear about your sense of self-worth because often I think what happens is as a minority I know I need to please the majority to get to the next step and it's very easy then for all of my sense of self-worth to be tied up in the compliments that I get back when I please the majority so so that sense of self-worth is a very delicate thing that that should be protected and cultivated the, the second big thing is I think to Lucy's point this uh, whether you call it your self-care approach but to me the a strong network of friends and family who support you and very clear ideas on how you maintain your mental health, because it's possible that you're not going to be held inside this organization for a while. And so your ability to replenish yourself from other sources and your ability to sustain yourself becomes very, very important. Um, the other big piece for me was in building an internal network of like minded people whether it's my ability to pay it forward or just to find other people that I can talk my colored Afrikaans with, that I can be myself with and go, man, those people were crazy. Um, and, and, and in my particular company, it's quite a, a very uh, contextual organization, the, the, the politics shift from leader to leader. Um, and I find like reaching out to, uh, to, to black teammates when they arrive and going, understand that that place is like Belgium and that place is like France. The leader sets a different tone and where I can hold people, I find it nourishes me too. Um, but I think maybe the biggest thing that's really happening for me now in my mid thirties is, is realizing that if I'm, in order for me to have the kind of influence I want, I need to get these people to trust me. It needs to be in the way I work. And so there's a lot of reflection for me around, am I, do I work in a way that builds trust? You know, maybe I go slower at certain points so I can get more consensus. Maybe that gets me, gets, sticks my neck out, but you know, like that person will trust me because of it. And I need to build this network of senior leaders and people at my level who will go to war with me, who know that I have their back. And, and sometimes that means taking a stand with some of them and saying, but, but hopefully if I keep doing this, if I keep building those relationships well, I can pull that person into a room and go, listen, I know that's not necessarily your perspective, but that was not cool. And here's why. Um, and I think for me on, on, a, on a bigger stage, and I saw Ntombi Zamasala's uh, comment in the questions where she, she talks about, well, what, should I even invest in this if you know, it takes so long for me to, to, to gain, to, to be held? And for me, I think there's kind of two things there. The first is, I think we know it is improving. So there's a little bit of hope from that. But the, the second piece is, is that's still the magic of how great work happens. <laughs> if you, for you as a leader to hold someone creates that background, creates the environment for the magic to happen for yourself. Like I often think like a, 
I'm not a professional footballer, so I won't have that perfect seven move sequence that is beauty expressed. It's this, it's a great meeting, it's a great presentation. It's this feeling of walking out of something and achieving something with someone. And for me, trying to build that altruism inherently into how I work um, and accepting, you know, cool, maybe there are people who are more not as talented as I feel I am who are gonna get ahead of me. It's a longer game for me. Um, but, but I guess those are kind of my big things, um, really, the self-care idea, this idea of thinking about the way I work um, and my self-worth, uh, understanding how much I had attached to people complimenting me. Thank you so much, Marlon. And um, actually just signaling to our panelists, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and move into this discussion of uh, self-care. Many of you have mentioned that DEI, uh, this, this work can be personally taxing. And I, of course, have, been, have experienced this myself. Um, so what drives you to stay committed to pursuing greater diversity, equity, and inclusion? And um, if you can, I share with us some of the uh, self-care uh, strategies that you use. And um, if you have any um, particular uh, challenges that you've overcome uh, that might be instructive for, for our audience, then um, I, I think that um, people are eager. And uh, in particular, uh, the, the, the audience member who, who uh, posted the question about the, the long <laughs> uh, journey ahead. So Zoe, would, can, can I start with you? It's a, it's a very, it's a very interesting question, and I think there's a quote, and I'm going to completely mangle it. And I think it's a Dr. Martin Luther King quote about the arc of history is long, but it's bent towards justice, something like that. I think I've sort of got it in the right direction. And I'm constantly buoyed by that, that this is a on so many fronts, the diversity front, and so many other social and political fronts. It, it, this is a long arc of history that we need to play. But all I can do is make my small contribution in my small moments, and I cannot affect the whole. So I know we were sort of chatting about it before, pre-call, I've been off media all day. I, it's not gonna help me make decisions that I need to make today. So. So I, I'm very conscious of what part I can play and I can do I can do some things that make a difference and I cannot, one of my self cares is I don't allow myself to worry about things. I try not to worry about things I can't control. I try really hard. And I learned that actually after 9-11 when I was living in the US and I took myself off all media, which was very easy in those days because it was only the television uh, because that feed of anxiety into my brain was not helping me do the things I needed to do for the, to care for the people who were around me. And that's something I've carried with me to this very day, in fact, trying to make sure that things are going into my brain are helping me make the right decisions to take care of all the people around me, all my stakeholders, and not overwhelm me with anxiety. So it's kind of the same self-care you use for everything in life that applies to the diversity as well. A bit of staying power, a bit of uh, ignoring the noise, a bit of not letting too much negative stuff into your head and of pursuing what you think is the right thing to do, making the next decision that you need to make. And the next decision I often say, and I'll say to my, my children, it's left foot, right foot and breathe. And that's going to be enough. Thank you. Um, Zoe, do, do you have any thoughts here? I do. Thank you for asking. And I'm in, I enjoyed listening to Susan and I look forward to hearing from Lucy and Marlon as well on this. I think we, we all need to, to attend to this. So they actually asked me recently for a, for a write-up in HBR about how to um, brace yourself for potential disappointment um, in the context of, of this week. And I'm going to share a couple of thoughts that I, I shared with them here as well. The first point is I'm also going to quote one of our um, great leaders from, from that era, Susan. Um, Maya Angelou very famously wrote, and as the caged bird sings, that she was, quote, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between. I, um, I generally find her words very, very touching and very inspiring. And um, they're with me today, and they're, they're with me a lot with respect to this work. Um, 
I also, as Marlon talked earlier about how we need to um, focus on our, our sense of self-worth when we're members of, of underrepresented groups um, within whatever contexts we're working. And uh, related to that, there's um, we social psychologists connect this um, idea of a self-system and our, our feelings of value and our feelings of self-worth as being the extent to which we see ourselves in a, in a positive light, um, and also really being connected with what Susan was talking about a minute ago in terms of living in accordance with our values. So to the extent that we live in accordance with our own core personal values, that helps us to see ourselves as people of worth. And so I think that's um, very intertwined with this for me as well, um, because I, I need to feel that I'm, I'm doing the best that, that I can do and living in accordance with my values. Um, but to be clear, that doesn't mean that I always do this perfectly. I don't know anybody who does this work perfectly. And so another focus that, that I strive to have um, with respect to this work in particular is really focusing on learning to be the best that I can be in this space. And when I do make mistakes, and I do, I strive to make those learning opportunities to acknowledge the mistake that I've made, apologize for it, and take a, a step forward towards, um, towards learning and integrating that learning in the future. Um, there's one more thing that I, I wanna share in this interview, which is that um, some of you may have, one of you has heard me about a temper tantrum I've thrown at least recently. Um, so I, I do think it's important for us to be able to have people that we can um, connect with in a way that, uh, I forget who it was, somebody shared a minute ago as well, that we need to be able to say like, ah, and then go back into the room. And having, a, having connections with people who can help us make sense of, was that as crazy as it sounded to me as helpful? And then also um, using that social support that we get from our connections who understand what we're doing. And even those who just love us and appreciate us and, and will, will help us figure out our way, even if they don't really get what we're doing here. I found all that to be very important. Thank you, Zoe. And Lucy, we, we've heard some uh, strategies from you um, more on a, a sort of, uh, Farm level or general level, can you share with us some, some uh, personal strategies? Yeah, um, thanks, Felicia. So for me, the strategy starts from my why. Why am I doing this? Why do I did do did I even agree to do this? Uh, and my my commitment to diversity and inclusion is really not only about work. It's it's a personal commitment. It's a personal personal commitment I've made for. Uh, many, many years. So I'm able to put my work in the context of, as Zoe highlighted, my values, the outcomes I want out of right, the, what the impact Susan talks about journey, the impact I want to make, not just in my company, but in the world. So the starting point is, is the why, which is much broader. And when people, sometimes friends ask me um, to articulate that why, I, I put it in very simple terms. I say to them that, you know, um, God give me life. When I'm an old woman, if my children and grandchildren are having exactly the same conversations I'm having today, I would have failed. Because I know as an individual, I can't change the whole world. But if collectively we can move things forward so that um, that arc that bends in the direction of, of justice actually is making a difference and their, their priorities when it, when it comes to being included are different from mine and their conversations are different, then that's a good thing. And so that kind of, that is a sort of a source of energy every day, the why and knowing who I'm doing it for is a great source of, um, source of energy. I think to, to and, and, and to be honest, it's part of the motivation for, for writing my book, even though it's really set in the context of Africa, it's in this context of people being uplifted, people being able to have a different generational um, conversation and, and engagement. The, the, you know, one of the day-to-day the, the -day challenges, because I find switching off from media can be quote unquote easy, because I can like say this week, I'm not interested, I'm not listening to what's going on and, and I can happily do that. I think the harder part uh, from a personal point of view 
is sitting in that meeting room and hearing someone say something that you can't step away from, that you can't respond to. And the way I describe it to people is that if 10 people say something wrong and I respond to every single one of them, the takeaway for most people is going to be, she's, she's always got an issue with what people say. She's always you know, angry as we, you know, a lot of black women get easily labeled. So you, you start to ask yourself, so of those 10 times, how many of them would I respond to? And let me give you a very specific example. People find it so easy to say there aren't any qualified um, minorities for the job. <laughs> and it just rolls off the tongue. It's like, we should all know it. Like it's, it's some kind of known fact that we should all know. And you're sitting in the room and you hear people say this, people you'd expect not to say this, but they feel they're right. And they feel they've been right for so long. And in that moment, I have to contain and hold myself because if I'm going to respond to that every single time, I'll be responding all day long and draining myself. But that holding and containing something that is obviously not just wrong, but counter to what you're trying to achieve is, is hard. So that's where at the end of the day, you do need some kind of release valve. You can't hold all those emotions and feelings in and carry them on into the next day and on and on and on. You'll just explode. So the self-awareness to say, look, what I just heard doesn't sit right with me in this forum. Maybe this is not where to address it. I'll find another place to engage and address it more systemically. But for my own self, I need to process it and deal with it and, and let it let it out and move on. Um, so, you know, there's a why, there's a who, and there's a, you know, how on a daily basis that I try to employ, not perfectly, but I try to employ um, to keep going. Thank you so much, Lucy. Marlon, um, you've shared with us a, a fair number of strategies, and I, and I hate to ask you for more, but I, um, some of my work looks at mentoring, which sometimes can be a double-edged sword. Um, I would be happy to hear from you about how mentors can help and how they might sometimes actually not be particularly useful um, in, in this journey. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think some, in my personal experience, what I found was it was best to accumulate my mentors for specific reasons. And in part because some of the advice and some of the perspective wouldn't always be relevant to different pieces. Um, so I try and so, so my general approach around it uh, is exactly that is there need to be people inside the organization. And in general, in, uh, my general guide is I'm looking for value compatibility. I'm looking for people who, you know, get nerdily excited about the same things as me and, and want to have fun at work and, and, and they live their values in a particular way. Um, for me, a, a big value that I love is, is inquisitiveness, and I, I, I like jumping into different areas and work. So I try and find these people from different perspectives in the organization. But there's a strategic element for me internally. It's that I'm also trying to triangulate who has good share of voice within that, um, uh, and, and trying to make sure that I can get some time with, with those specific people. But I think what I've generally found with these mentoring relationships is at the very least in the first two or three meetings, it's way more me, us trying to get to know each other because part of how I try and use them is I try and bring problems to those meetings and say, here's how I'm unpacking them. Am I right or wrong? But if there's a strong enough base between the two of us, I can turn around and go, listen, that's not gonna work for me. I, like, I appreciate that that may work in your context um, because I think that's also the value that the mentor gets out of, out of, of having an interaction with me. So in general, I think absolutely, Felicia, there's, a, there's, there's always a risk if you only have one or two mentors. I, for me, my strategy is generally to try and be specific and try to accumulate them for the right moment in my life. Um, uh, and, and in general, that, that, that helps. I think it's, it's helped me get held within the organization that I'm in. Um, but, but yes, absolutely. I find if you're not, if you're not absolutely uh, clear about why you want that person in your life, and why you want to have a conversation with that person. You, you expose yourself to a risk of, of bad advice or, or the wrong kind of conversation. Thank you so much, Marlon. We have some questions in coming from the audience and um, we, we are short on, on, we're beginning to be short on time. Uh, there, there are uh, two uh, questions from the audience that I'd like to um, uh, group together. And one um, is asking about the definition of diversity. 
Um, are we allowing this effort uh, to be branded by the dominant uh, uh, work of race, gender, and cultural uh, diversity? Um, are there other dimensions of diversity or is there, should we be thinking about diversity um, more broadly uh, than, than these three dimensions? And uh, Zoe, I would love to hear uh, your perspective here. Thanks for asking, Felicia, um, and to the to the audience members asking. Um, the way I think about this is that the examples of race and gender serve wonderfully developed examples for us. And we there's a lot of work that's been done with respect to these in particular contexts. And so these are useful and helpful. And the fact that half of the world is female and a, a significant number of individuals um, are black and are underrepresented in leadership in most parts of the world are, are meaningful. So we need to not ignore those. With that in mind, there are um, individuals within every society in the world that have been subjugated for one reason or another. In some places that's religion, in some places that is caste, in some places that is um, something different. And so I do think it's important for us to think about the broad trends on a global level that we need to pay attention to and also to look within our, our, our um, local communities and to look at who are the people who are underrepresented in the, um, with respect to power and with respect to leadership in the contexts where we are working. So thanks for asking. Thank you, Zoe. And Susan, I saw that you had a, you had a vigorous reaction as well. I'd like to um, combine this, this question, thinking about how are we defining diversity with a second question about metrics. Um, someone is asking how, uh, are, what are some good uh, metrics for tracking diversity, some indicators or assessments? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely was having a strong reaction to that question. And the, 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 all, all the obvious metrics are around measuring things and whether you think it's quotas or targets, the, there's all those metrics of collecting data so you can actually shine a light on uh, are you paying people equally? Um, are you having short lists that are 50-50 male-female, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's the kind of easy stuff in terms of metrics. And personally, I found the mandating shortlists have 50% women or, or whatever metric you're trying to pursue is a very effective tool. Uh, but the harder one, and then why I was reacting to that question was, there's a, a, a very talented woman in Australia, um, Juliette Burke, who's written a book called, Which Two Heads Are Better Than One? On the premise that it's not any two heads are better than one. And her thing is all about thinking styles. And that's super hard to measure. Uh, how do you assess your team and think about you actually need all these different types of thinking styles to get the value of all of the brains in the room? Um, you could be very ethnically diverse, very gender diverse, very sexual orientation diverse, but actually all think the same way. Hmm. So, so her work was uh, really unpacked for me. You know, well, maybe we need to think about our teams and do some interventions to look at who thinks in a certain way and does that team all think in the same method, no matter who they are and where they've come from, what gender they are, they're actually all the same people. That's not diversity. So the really hard thing to measure, but the really valuable thing is which two heads are better than one. That is a great title and I will I will have to look for that. Up. Well, yeah, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, Zoe, I, I want to come back to you. Um, uh, a question about um, something that I that I hope uh, can can be helpful for some of our uh, students who are watching. Um, many business leaders are going to pass through business schools, either as uh, MBA students or executive education participants. What uh, can they be doing during their business studies to prepare? for uh, some of the challenges that they might face or to lead uh, the change that we also desperately need. I'll try to be quick because I wanna hear more from our, our other panelists as well still, but the, the two things that I can recommend most strongly are strive to gain knowledge, point number one, 
because assuming that we already know all about this at any stage of our lives is a mistake in my own humble opinion as somebody who's still learning about this even though it is an area of my expertise. So strive to learn as much as you can, point number one. And point number two, try to use your time while you're studying as a, a lab or a, a learning space, an experimental place to ask your colleagues, your classmates, please let me know if you see me doing anything that could be representing bias, could be something subtle, like you delegate the housekeeping work within your work team to a, a woman or a member of an underrepresented ethnic group. So just ask them to call you out and try to observe, try to learn as much as you can about this while you're learning about your um, economics and your financial models and all of that as well. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, we are indeed uh, short on time and I, and I see a couple of questions that we have not uh, yet been able to address. Um, I am, See, well, one is about um, personal social identity and how it relates to your workspace. And I feel that our panelists have shared quite uh, personally and vulnerably about uh, some, of, some of the uh, challenges related to their own social identity. So I hope that, that uh, it, it feels that that question has been addressed. Uh, the other question relates to biases within groups. Um, so within social identity groups, we often uh, speak about um, uh, you know, unconscious bias training or other programs targeted at the majority um, without uh, recognizing that some of the, uh, you know, we've all been socialized in, uh, in, in the same culture. Um, I do think that uh, Susan's uh, answer, the, the uh, which two heads, um, begins to address some of that. We cannot consider um, underrepresented cultures as monolithic and we, as Marlon has begged, um, need to be considering people as individuals. So I hope that that, um, that has uh, addressed at least, or began to address uh, some, some of that question. Um, with our final seconds, um, I would love to hear uh, really uh, just a, a, a brief takeaway from each of you. And um, Marlon, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Sure. I, I guess, uh, Felicia, for me, I guess the, the thing I always come back to here is we have different perspectives on this because of a knowledge gap. I have an experience, I have life experience that allows me to fill that knowledge gap. But in general, when I sit across the, uh, the chair from uh, the table from a white person who doesn't, have that, the only difference here is if you knew the history, if you knew the stories, you would, you would understand. And so often, I think, uh, I think if I say the name wrong, my apologies, Shupreet uh, has asked the question about how, how to deal with it with family and love and members. What I generally try and do is I try and make sure in those conversations that I'm stressing how much I love them while also not backing down on the points that I make. I've gotten to the point in my mid thirties where I'm unapologetic about my blackness and unapologetic about who I am, but at the same time that I can love you and have a difficult conversation. So that is one way. So again, I can be quite intense, I suspect from that perspective, but I guess we're a generation of South African kids with zero patience on this. Um, the, um, but I think the other big thing for me is just, uh, it's a knowledge gap. Start with the knowledge, go and understand the way that you haven't been told the true stories about great black male and female leaders. And I promise if you just go and understand that you'll understand that we share humanity and that it's something that connects us all. That for me is generally the point that I come back to. Just for, it's a knowledge gap. And if you understand it, your behavior will change. Thank you so much, Marlon. Um, Susan. I, I want to build on Marlon's point because it's, it is a very good one. Uh, the, the history of Indigenous Australia is an absolutely terrible history. Indigenous Australians were not counted in the census until very late, they were counted actually under flora and fauna, not humans. And many white Australians don't know that. And I've seen the effect in our own organization when we started to unpack understanding indigenous Australia, the, the way that that reshaped how people think about difference has been really powerful. But to a point we we're making before, it was if it was tokenism and corporate spin, it would be just window dressing and offensive, and nobody would take anything from it. But that I, I do think that that real genuine 
can you try and walk in this person's shoes, even in your imagination? Really opens up a dialogue to understand the world is not defined by middle-aged white people. And we need to understand that and create the environment where people can walk into other people's shoes, at least in their imagination, if they can't do it for real. I, I think that's a, a very powerful, very powerful tool. So much, Susan. Um, Zoe, we would love your closing thoughts, but we are so short on time, and and um, we we have the privilege of having one of our uh, our board members uh, and uh, um, uh, again an NCAT All Star. So I'd really love to give the final word to Lucy Quist, please. Um, thank you very much, Felicia, and thank you, Zoe, for um, you know creating the space. I'm going to make some you know three very brief points. Um, and I really want people to hopefully, um, after listening to everybody, to food for thought to, to, to a takeaway. I think when we think about diversity, and I, I actually took the time to try and find out more, let's think about what's visible and what's not visible. And that goes to the earlier points raised, right? And when I, I rock up, you, you, you see a black woman, you don't see a Christian and all the other things that ma matter to me. So it's really important, really take and time to understand. Um, and to Marlon's point about different experiences, listen to people, try and listen as much as possible, try and listen objectively and, and learn from them because you will start to learn about what's visible and what's invisible. But the final point I want to make, um, which may sound controversial to some, but I hope everybody goes home and thinks about it. We have gotten this completely wrong, right? First of all, um, we continue to talk about diversity from a white perspective, number one, and we need to address that. But even more importantly, if we look at ourselves um, as a globe, where I say we've got it wrong is that whiteness is a minority. It's not the majority. And so we've taken a minority position, standardized it, and, and decided that all the rest of us have to kind of revolve around it. Where, where, where I hope we get to one day is where the beauty of the difference of all human beings is respected as equally human and not a small minority globally dictating what it means to be human, whether, whether what it means to be intelligent, beautiful, acceptable, and all these other things. Uh, and that is where I want to leave us with food for thought. Some may be listening and thinking, wow, she didn't just say that, but that is honestly what I think as an individual, not as my company, but as myself, I think we need to switch the conversation. Thank you so much, Lucy. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, really such inspiring words. And unfortunately, we are out of time. So um, with that, I, I thank all of our panelists. And I also want to uh, thank the INSEAD Africa Club and the INSEAD Women in Business Club for organizing this event with us and Accenture uh, Strategy for partnering with uh, the Hoffman Global Institute on uh, 2020 SDG week. I uh, thank you also to the operation team at uh, and the uh, Hoffman Institute team for making things happen uh, in the background. And I invite all of our audience members to register for other events on sustainability that are coming up uh, during the rest of SDG week. Um, you have uh, sustainability uh, for climate action or uh, careers uh, in sustainability uh, impact uh, on entrepreneurship um, and all of the ones shown here on the slide. And these are free and open to all. With that, good uh, afternoon, good evening, good day to everyone. And uh, thank you again um, uh, for, for uh, joining us. Thank you. Bye, everybody.